with Nottingham Forest. One way or another, Brian Clough intended to win. He had put almost 2,000 tickets onto the black market. It put his own fans at risk, but Clough stood to make a huge private profit. Tonight, Weldon Action investigates Brian Clough's secret deals and the club that let him get away with them. For 40 years, Brian Clough, the maverick genius, entertained his fans on and off the football fields of Europe. I think I would like the supreme job of, uh, of dictating football, dictating football, dictating football. His taste for controversy and his grand ambitions made him a folk hero. He came close to managing both England and Wales. He was asked to stand for Parliament and he led his teams to glory. He was a genius at making ordinary players into great players, better players than they had any right to expect. And he did this by, if you like, hypnotising them. He always said he could, without even looking at players, influence everything they did from the stand. And I think that's true. He did wonders for our club, brought us, pulled us up from about boot strings, right up to the top, to the pinnacle of any any footballing era. And also, it did the city a lot of good. January 1975, Brian Clough arrives at a Nottingham Forest threatened with relegation to the third division. The next year, his old friend Peter Taylor joined him and success soon followed. Promotion, the league title, two European Cups. To the public, Clough was a disciplinarian with a heart of gold. In private, he was breaking the rules. Forrest became known as the team who played for cash. Two new boys in the Forrest team, number seven from Switzerland, Ponte, and their new number nine, the million pound man, Ian Wallace. August 1980 in Dublin. Forrest are the star attraction at a benefit match for the Irish international fullback, Paddy Mulligan. There was a price. £7,000 in cash to Brian Clough's right-hand man, Peter Taylor, after the game. Clough's lawyers threatened anyone who suggested he'd personally shared this cash. But there is evidence that during Clough's reign, Forrest developed a taste for backdoor payments. In 1982, struggling Scunthorpe United were offered an attractive, friendly match against Forrest. The fourth division side were made an offer they did not refuse. Brian Clough had said that he could sort it out, providing he got 1,500 quid because he needed to look after a few of his star players. How did he want the 1,500 pounds paid? In cash. Why was that? Well, I you suppose you could probably ask Mr Clough that, but there's probably an obvious answer to it. I pointed out to the other members that the club couldn't possibly pay Mr Clough or anybody else a cash payment. Not only was it in breach of inland revenue regulations, but also we would breach our fiduciary duties as a director. If five directors wanted to put £300 each in, out of their own pocket, out of tax paid income, and have a £300 night out and help the club, then that was a possible way of doing it. That was agreed, and five directors put £300 each in. This is a noise for Kingsley! October 1989. Forest play tiny Kings Lynn FC. It is the benefit season for the Forest goalkeeper Steve Sutton. Sutton himself would pass some of his fee to charity. Forest initially had asked for a modest payment. We did receive a letter from Forest to the effect that they would be looking for reimbursement of their travelling expenses, which we interpreted in the first instance and were told ver verbally that uh, it would mean the driver's wages and a tank full of diesel for the coach. The letter was signed by the then assistant manager, Ron Fenton. But on match night, just six weeks later, there was a sudden new demand delivered through a middleman. 
the sum was around a thousand pounds. And uh, asked what this was for because I was absolutely flabbergasted. Couldn't believe it. And when I queried it, oh, well, we must have it. We must have it. So I said, right, well, we'll arrange to get you a check drawn. Oh, no, we don't want a check. It must be cash. It must be cash. And subsequent to the Forest game, uh, Tottenham Hotspur played a game. Not a penny changed hands. Liverpool sent a team. They charged legitimate travelling expenses. Perfectly kosher transaction. An absolute disgrace. An absolute disgrace. I've never forgotten it. One doesn't expect this of one of the most famous clubs in the land. At his previous clubs, Brian Clough's abrasive personality had caused destructive clashes with his bosses. At Derby and at Leeds, the directors had money in the clubs, and money equals power. At Forest, Clough found a club where he could call the shots. It was run by a committee, like a village team. Then in 1982, it became a limited company. But it was set up to prevent anyone getting a powerful stake in the club. The aim was to prevent outsiders buying in and taking control. But it left a power vacuum. He didn't like directors. He thought they were worthless. He didn't think chairmen were much good. Um, but when he settled into Nottingham Forest Football Club, decided he rather liked it there. And because of the setup of, of the, that gentleman's club, as it was called, where nobody could put money in and take control of the thing, uh, he realised that he could play off directors against each other, get rid of troublemakers. Even by football's variable standards, Clough has had some unlikely people supervising him at Forest. In 1976, Derek Pavis, a local plumber's merchant, joined the board. He eventually became vice chairman. Twelve years before, he'd admitted offering a bribe to a Forest player to throw a match. In 1980, Stuart Dryden, a village sub postmaster, was found guilty of defrauding the post office. He'd been the chairman of Forest for 18 months. And Morris Roweth, an accountant, had been chairman for even longer when he was sentenced to jail this year for an £850,000 fraud against clients and friends. In his hands was a business now worth £11 million a year. Between them, Dryden and Roweth were chairman of Forest for 11 of Clough's 18 years. He befriended them uh, and they became very reliant upon him and in the end no chairman of Nottingham Forest had the courage to say anything untoward to Brian. This is a, a very democratic club and it has been for 128 years. I've not heard many people say whatever his qualities that Brian Clough was a democrat. No, but this, this club has been run for 128 years and we've had uh, success admittedly only main success when Brian Clough was the manager. Brian Club got what he wanted because you daren't let him go because he was the only thing that ever brought this club success. It wasn't a case of daren't letting him go, we appreciated his skills. By the early 1990s, Brian Clough was the elder statesman of British football, one of the longest serving managers at any club, his salary approaching £200,000 a year. His team were winning again after a quiet spell. In four years, they played in six lucrative Wembley finals. Brian Clough was not slow to cash in on this success. For the first time, tonight, a Forest insider has emerged to tell the truth about Clough's secret dealings in a scarce but valuable commodity, big match tickets. Four months ago, he asked the Forest management to call in the police after a cover-up involving club funds. For two and a half years, he was the ticket manager at Forest. His name is Andrew Plum. In 1991, Forrest were about to play an FA Cup semi-final against West Ham. Out of a doorway appeared Mr Clough. Um, he'd been drinking, rather heavily it seemed, and demanded that I go back to my office and fetch about 200 tickets and bring them straight back to him. He followed that up by saying that every minute he waited he would double his request. He swore when he said it. I walked back to my office, rang the secretary internally, told him that this is what has been requested of me and what to do. The secretary, knowing full well that 
if he said, don't give Brian Clough the tickets, the chairman would overrule him, said, you might as well issue him with the tickets. So I did. How many did he receive in all? In all, for the semi-final, he received, received just under 500 tickets. He paid in cash. Ticket touts operating outside Manchester United, Britain's best supported team. To the football authorities, they're an embarrassment. To the police, they're a pest. To the fans, they're at best an expensive last hope. There are huge profits to be made by touts at cup finals. For example, in 1990, the average markup on a touted ticket was £140. And a £25 ticket, for example, was changing hands at anything up to £350. The tout, like the drug dealer, he will sell his tickets regardless of the consequences. He's not concerned about the consequences of his action, he's only concerned about the profit. To control the supply to the touts, clubs are supposed to limit the numbers they issue to any one person. The only games for which controls are strictly enforced are FA Cup finals, because the clubs are obliged to account to the football authorities. Brian Clough used the columns of The Sun to rant against these rules just before the 1991 FA final against Spurs. I can't believe it. They've said the allocation is 24 for me, the players and all the rest of the staff. Is it an FA rule? Well, in the circumstances, I think our lot could have seen their way clear to get me one or two more. By obtaining 500 semi-final tickets, Brian Clough and Nottingham Forest had gone far outside the rules of football. Under FA rules, it is misconduct if anyone has sold or offered for sale, either directly or indirectly, a ticket for any football match in excess of face value. The FA has taken a hard line over cup final tickets. This month, the former England goalie, Ray Clements, was banned from receiving tickets for three years because just two of his tickets fell into the touts' hands. But the biggest concern has been safety. Lord Justice Taylor's inquiry into the Hillsborough football disaster said, the activities of touts have a grossly antisocial effect leading both directly and indirectly to disorder. There are serious safety implications involved. When you buy a touted ticket and you go to the ground, you quite likely will end up at the wrong end of the ground with rival supporters. Segregation arrangements go to the wall. Football is very much a partisan sport where it is necessary to separate uh, the two groups of supporters. What happens when segregation breaks down? Well, then, of course, uh, you, you've got um, the problems with safety, you've got the problems with law and order, and this is where opposing groups can, in fact, then come face to face and, and that then generates into problems. Andrew Plum says Clough received 28 season tickets a year from Forrest with a combined value of over £5,000. On top of that were complaints from supporters about tickets for Forrest's home matches. We would receive complaints from people who had been turned away from the ticket office at the city ground having been told that tickets were sold out only to be offered bundles of tickets outside the gate um, from ticket touts uh, at prices way over face value. On one such occasion, I sent a friend to purchase one of these tickets so I could trace the source. The source was eventually traced back to complimentary tickets issued to Mr Clough. The streets of London, April last year. A nasty street fight between Nottingham Forest and Manchester United supporters is captured on an amateur video. The hooligans were on their way to Wembley for the Rumbelows Cup final. So was Brian Clough. The match against Manchester United would be his last appearance there as a manager. In the sold-out crowd were many Forest family supporters. The Rumbelows Cup had been nicknamed the family final. Uh, I don't normally go to football matches, but the children were keen that we should make it a family outing, so we all went. We were surprised to find a row of Manchester United fans on the row in front. There were about eight or ten of them, and they were chanting, and it was obvious from, an, from the atmosphere that was developing, it was obvious that the, there was going to be some trouble. We asked the steward to make sure he was in the right seats. He says yes. We asked about the Man U fans. Are they? He went down, checked the tickets came back and says, they must be, they've got the tickets. The fans got very aggressive towards each other because they were in 
close proximity to each other. And we saw fighting, or we saw the police going into the crowd behind the goal where most of the forest fans were. There's that many people fighting down the gangways and round the back. He just wanted a good punch up, really. There was a bit of a punch up, sort of a few people away from me. And that had me worried because I was head and shoulders smaller than everybody else. And I couldn't see what was happening. And the gates were shut, Dad told me. And I was just wondering when we were going to get out. Well, I, I just wasn't interested in the football, really. It, it had just taken all appetite for the, for the match away. I was just, uh, I was just fearful for, for the consequences if, if the forest did equalise. Mercifully, the worst violence in the corridors under the stands was contained by the police. But something had gone badly wrong. Wembley Stadium acknowledged in letters to fans that it was the first time for a long time that we have had disorder at a match. The senior policeman at the ground, Chief Superintendent Eric Brown, protested to the Football League about the large number of Manchester fans in seating which should have been exclusively for Nottingham Forest. Some United fans obtained tickets from neutral clubs, but large numbers had come from an astonishing source. Mr Clough made demands for and received nearly 2,000 tickets for the Rumble O's Cup final, issued by me through the secretary in batches of three or 400. I witnessed, along with other supporters, violent scuffles and fighting, both in the stands and underneath in the refreshment concourse. Because I had recorded, by way of keeping the ticket stubs, what tickets were issued to Mr Clough, I was able to identify the blocks where the trouble was occurring and trace them back to the tickets which were issued to Mr. Clough. Was anyone else involved in obtaining large numbers of tickets for that cup final? The assistant manager of the time, Ron Fenton, obtained 300 tickets for the Rumble House Cup final. He paid for them the next day. I remember he'd been bringing the money in a plastic carrier bag, all in five pound notes for them. Mr. Fenton insists that this is untrue. After the final, fans started to complain about the United invasion. Forest, the Football League and Wembley Stadium gave a version of events which did not reveal the full story. Forest promised there would be an investigation. We knew full well where the majority of the tickets were obtained from. Um, so basically we, we left the supporters to stew for a few weeks in the guise of, of carrying out investigations and then responded with the response that uh, the tickets were obtained from other clubs um, through their league allocations. You didn't know how many tickets the manager had had for a cup final? Well, the tickets, the records were kept for the requisite time and then obviously they were destroyed in, a, in accordance with the rules of the you, competition. No one could recall how many tickets Brian Clough had had? No. The, well, then the only witness is the ticket manager who was in charge of them and he says Clough had 2,000. Well, if he said that, but nobody, I'd disagree with that, actually. Brian Clough had broken the rules on selling tickets, and his fans, the police and stadium stewards had to put up with the consequences. What's more, £20,000 was missing from Forrest's accounts for the match. Andrew Plum says that there was no proof that Clough had even paid for all his tickets. Mr Clough had received about £50,000 worth of tickets in batches of 10, 12,000 pounds worth at a time. Were these paid for on delivery? Every time I issued a batch of tickets which were destined for Mr. Clough, I never personally received payment for them. That was your responsibility, you were the ticket manager. Even though that was my responsibility to make sure that all the tickets were paid for. I was later advised by the secretary that the tickets were definitely paid for, but was unable to obtain confirmation of how and when they were paid for. Plum says that he then shuffled money around various ticket accounts, hoping the 20,000 would turn up. A year later, he wrote to the club resigning, telling them that he could cover up no more. He asked that they call in the police. That was in June. Forrest have only just done so. It's actually now uh, matter for the police and so I wouldn't I can't answer any query on when that. did it become a matter of the police the police yesterday what have you asked the police to do to investigate um, mr. Plum when this interview was over we asked the police to confirm mr. Reacher's remarks 
no investigation into Mr. Plum was underway. A day later, Mr. Reacher finally did get round to informing the police. Forrest is a divided club. Some shareholders want more openness about the way it's run. Brian Clough is at the heart of the trouble. There were allegations in court this summer that he had asked for a cash bung for a transfer, allegations he has denied. There was the transfer to Italy of the star player Des Walker for one and a half million pounds, nearly three million less than a previous rival bid. There was the sudden extension to Clough's contract a year ago, despite poor results and a worrying alcohol problem. Now there is the row over Brian Clough's use of tickets, a big secret until tonight. But Andrew Plum says that the club chairman, Fred Reacher, and the secretary, Paul White, knew all about it nearly 18 months ago. Whilst I was waiting uh, in the corridor within the Nottingham Forest offices to speak to Paul White, um, he was being asked by Mr Reacher how many tickets Mr Clough had had. Mr White told Mr Reacher how many tickets he'd had. 2,000. Yes, and Mr Reacher nodded and acknowledged the information, but did nothing further. When did you first hear that Brian Clough had had 2,000 tickets for the 1992 Rumblers Cup final? I've never heard that he's had 2,000 tickets. Well, that's untrue, Mr. Reacher. I'm it? sorry, I have heard a figure mentioned. Yes, I have heard, yes, I'll rephrase that. Um, I have heard this figure mentioned. Well, when did you first hear it? I should imagine when you started your investigation. In July. Would it be July, August? You didn't hear it raised before that? No. It was, in fact, early June when Andrew Plum asked the club in writing for an investigation into Clough's tickets. Since the Cup final in 1992, the scandal has remained a closely guarded secret, even from some club directors. I had no knowledge at the time of uh, anything like that happening. Had you been told, what would your reaction have been? I think my reaction would have been to call in the police, inform the FA, and possibly suspend the manager until uh, these allegations were either proved or disproved. How seriously would you have viewed those allegations? Were they, in, were they true? If the allegations were true, obviously, my reaction would be for the removal of the manager immediately. Ironically, Brian Clough went instead for the same reason he'd previously been persuaded to stay, results. As the team slid towards relegation from the Premier League and controversy mounted about Clough's drinking habits, the chairman bit the bullet and announced the manager was to go. Brian Clough had to be a dictator to achieve what he had to achieve, rather like Mrs Thatcher. If she hadn't been a dictator, she wouldn't have done what she did. But he made the same mistake as Mrs Thatcher and many other dictators in not realising that his time was up. Brian Clough arrived at Nottingham Forest in 1975, already a rich man. He's reputed to be a millionaire several times over. You talked me into it, love. I asked for shredded wheat. Someone is... Besides a salary and bonuses of over £200,000 a year, he had lucrative advertising contracts, arrangements with tabloid newspapers, and money for TV and public appearances. Steady, young man. Quite why he should need to deal in black market tickets with all the risks is not clear. Brian Clough, unusually, had nothing to say for himself when we asked the question. Did you give those tickets to a ticket, Todd? Can you answer the question, please, Mr Clough? We understand that you removed 2,000 tickets. Did you pay for those tickets? Those tickets ended up in the hands of a ticket, Todd. Please answer the question, Mr Clough. These are important matters, sir. Do you think this club is a fit and proper club to be, remain a member of the Football League? Of course I do. Allegations of bungs, cash for friendly games, thousands of tickets going astray for important matches. Prove it. Since you've not got better looking, you can call me Brian. Call me Brian. Call me Brian. Call me Brian.